Before we start, I should warn you that there will be some incredibly heavy spoilers for Blood and Wine in this video, so if you haven't completed that DLC just yet, click away and play that first. In today's video, I'll talk about the Witcher vampires, of course, but I'll also give you a bit of insight on the possible inspiration from real-world lore for the creatures themselves. And a fair bit of warning, throughout the entirety of the series dealing with vampires, because of course I can't talk about everything in just one video, there will be a lot of speculation. Feel free to speculate with me, of course. Vampires, one of the most beloved and most feared monsters, even in today's stories. Well, at least most of them. And we humans, as in the Witcher world, have conjured up many stories about these creatures. Most of them quite false. In the Witcher world, garlic has absolutely no effect on vampires. Holy water is great to bathe in. You don't turn into a vampire by being bitten by one. If that was the case, there would be nothing but vampires left at this point. Vampires are very much capable of crossing rivers. The tears of a virgin don't burn anyone, least of all vampires. And stakes through the heart is mostly just an inconvenience to them. Riding a black horse through a graveyard won't allow you to find the vampire's tomb in which they sleep during the day. Not in the least, because they generally don't really sleep unless they're trying to skip some centuries. In fact, most higher vampires have adapted quite well to staying out in the sun, should they wish to. Although most don't wish to, and there are some theories among vampires that daylight is deadly in the long run. They hardly ever ally themselves with witches, and they certainly won't be summoned by them, the nerve, and if we're to believe Regis, they're more inclined to sleep with a succubus than they are a witch. And vampires, of course, are also not undead at all. They're simply an entirely separate species. Geralt does note that the reason people think this is likely that it's hard to comprehend that you can lop off a vampire's head and it will still walk off at a brisk pace. However, it's all a matter of perspective, of course. Yes, indeed, said the vampire, impervious to the derision. Your mutated race is capable of regenerating its fingernails, toenails, hair and epidermis, but is unable to accept the fact that other races are more advanced in that respect. That inability is not the result of your primitiveness, quite the opposite. It's a result of egotism and a conviction in your own perfection. Anything that is more perfect than you must be a repulsive aberration. And repulsive aberrations are consigned to myths, for sociological reasons. Some folk even link elves to vampires, saying that elves are a vile and godless race, and that one of every two elves is condemned to die again, and arise as a vampire, of course. There are a few things that make some sense, though, such as silver. Although silver won't outright kill a vampire just by touching it, they don't seem to enjoy holding it either. When we ask Sienna how she met Detlaf, she tells us she realized something was off about him when he came to sell a silver candlestick. But he gripped the candlestick with a cloth to cover the silver. And of course the lesser vampires and the lesser higher vampires can simply be killed by it entirely. True higher vampires also do not in fact reflect in mirrors at all, nor do they have a shadow. Although it seems that in Blood and Wine our vampire friends have found a trick to cast one anyway. Oversight by CDBR or just vampires being clever. Hmm. Move away. He snapped at Milva. Regis didn't twitch, even though the point of the sword was pressing gently against his neck. The archer held her breath, seeing the barber surgeon's eyes glowing in the dark with a strange, cat-like light. Go on, Regis said calmly. Thrust it in. Geralt, Dandelion spoke up from the ground, totally alert. Are you utterly insane? He saved us from the gallows and patched me up. He saved us and the girl in the camp. Milva recalled softly. Be quiet, all of you. You don't know what he is. The barber surgeon did not move, and Milva suddenly saw what she ought to have seen long before. Regis did not cast a shadow. They also do drink blood. However, not all of them do so to survive. While many vampires do in fact drink blood to live, or in some cases simply eat the victim, Higher vampires, the kind that spawns the best stories, only drink it because it's tasty. They eat very regular food just like humans otherwise. 
Much like we would drink alcohol, they sip on an unsuspecting victim's neck instead. Children, as it stands, are the most delicious kind. That does have the unfortunate side effect of addiction, however. Overindulging in drinking blood can lead a vampire to become intoxicated. And being a blood addict can get one into immense trouble. I finally began to do absolutely unacceptable things. The kind of things no vampire does. I flew under the influence. One night, the boys sent me to the village to fetch some blood, and I missed my target. A girl who was walking to the well. I smashed straight into the well at top speed, and the villagers almost beat me to death. But fortunately, they didn't know how to go about it. They punctured me with stakes, chopped my head off, poured holy water all over me, and buried me. Can you imagine how I felt when I woke up? There are, of course, also a few things humans simply don't know about, although they might have guessed. For example, vampires have a very keen sense of smell, and they can obviously see in the dark. They're also particularly difficult to locate by both witchers and mages. It's entirely impossible to locate a vampire through magical detection probing or acquisition spells. So you won't be able to discover the location of a vampire from any long distance. And even if you, as a witcher, stand directly in front of a higher vampire, you still might not know. A witcher's medallion won't react to a higher vampire in their human disguise. Only when they reveal themselves, use their vampiric powers, will the medallion begin to vibrate. But don't worry, as long as you bring some dogs and cats, you'll be fine. They seem to react to higher vampires by sitting down in front of them and howling or meowing loudly. Horses also seem to notice them, although they all seem to get tricked easily by wearing lots and lots of herbs, like Regis does. But there are, of course, many different kinds of vampires, not just higher vampires, and for simplicity's sake, I will only call the true higher vampires higher vampires for now, so the likes of Regis, Detlaf, and Oriana. But outside of those, starting with the higher class vampires, let's say the intelligent vampires, we also have Alps, Katakan, Mula, Bruxa, and Nosferat. When Regis speaks of them, he notes that none of them are especially violent with their victims, generally sticking to just drinking their blood, and all of them display obvious intelligence over their lesser cousins. They don't eat human food like the higher vampires do, and they also all quite dislike being set on fire. Out of the lot, the two we never meet in either the books or the games are the Nosferat and the Mula. And I'm sure the name of the Nosferat alone conjures images of the well-known Nosferatu movie. Clearly intelligent vampires that seem closest to the higher vampires in nature. But we know little else of them due to never ever meeting them, unfortunately. The Mula may have been based on the Mulo or Muli from Roma folklore. Mulo meaning one who is dead. They are described as wearing white clothes, hair that reaches to their feet, and one physical oddity which differs from tail to tail. They seek out people they did not like in life and then harass them. In the case of the Witcher world, harassing them would likely mean to drink their blood until they die. If we go by the original folklore, a Mula would also be able to turn invisible. It's possible the Mula was cut from the games because they seemed too much like the Bruxa. And the Alp is already very much like a Bruxa, so... Too much of a good thing, perhaps? What's curious about the folklore behind this vampire, however, is that they make a very direct distinction between a male and a female type. A Muli is female and the Mulo is male. Whereas Bruxa and Alps in the books and games seem to be female and female only. Even though the Bruxa also has a male version in folklore, the Bruxo. Perhaps we've just never met them before. That's entirely possible, of course. So, let's talk about these creatures then. The Bruxa and the Alp, or Alpor. So very alike in so many ways. Both can turn into beautiful women, which they use often to seduce their victims into willingly following them into their lair. They're both incredibly fast, although Alps seem to prefer dodging over outright blocking like the Bruxa does. They both shriek loudly to knock their enemies off balance, but while the Bruxa can turn invisible, the Alp cannot. The Alp, however, can turn into animals at will, and her saliva can put a man to sleep, while the Bruxa cannot. And of course, the obvious, the Bruxa has dark hair, whereas the Alp has red hair, at least in their true form. Another similarity in the two is their penchant for singing. 
An easy way to lure their victims, no doubt, and a stark contrast to their loud shrieks during combat. And while neither seem very keen on talking at any point, they do communicate. Sometimes using short sentences, like Detlaf's Bruxa friend, or in the case of the Bruxa we meet in the books, Verena, she communicates telepathically. Although it has to be said, she was an exceptionally powerful Bruxa. So much so, that she could even turn into a giant bat. And that's not something you see most Bruxa do. She was quite fond of birds, though, and that is a very Bruxa trait indeed. The huge black eyes narrowed. Where is he, black-haired one? You were singing, so you've drunk some blood. You've taken the ultimate measure, which means you haven't managed to enslave his mind. Am I right? The black-tressed head nodded slightly, almost imperceptibly, and the corners of the mouth turned up even more. The tiny little face took on an eerie expression. No doubt you consider yourself the lady of this manor now. A nod, this time clearer. Are you a mula? A slow shake of the head. The hiss which reverberated through his bones could only have come from the pale, ghastly smiling lips, although the Witcher didn't see them move. Alpor? Denial. The Witcher backed away and clasped the hilt of his sword tighter. That means you're... The corners of the lips started to turn up higher and higher. The lips flew open. A Bruxa! The Bruxa being mostly taken from the Portuguese Bruxa, who turns into a bird at night and attacks unsuspecting travelers. In the stories, a Bruxa was literally a woman who became a vampire through witchcraft, and they are especially fond of drinking the blood of children. It was also said that they could turn into many different animals, like a rat, ant, or wolf, but it seems the game has granted that ability to Alps instead. It was strongly believed that the Bruxa was only active between midnight and 2 a.m., and while they don't lie dormant outside of those times, of course, Alps are described as being most active around midnight. The next story is that of the German Alp, who is, curiously, described as always male, Usually a recently deceased man, of course, but a woman can also birth one if she screws up tremendously during her pregnancy. The German Alp was strongly connected to nightmares, sleepwalking, and horrible fits and seizures during their sleep. And as we know, the Alp in the Witcher world can induce sleep through her saliva. And not only that, if their victim is already asleep, it is said they would have horrible nightmares. Fun fact, it's likely that the German word Alptraum originated from this creature. It means nightmare, and the Alp was also sometimes known as, you guessed it, Nachtma, which again means nightmare. Like the Portuguese Bruxa, Alps could also take on the forms of many animals, and in any form it took, it was said to wear a wide-brimmed hat, or Tarnkappe, meaning magic cap. Imagine running into an animal wearing a wide-brimmed hat now. It's probably an Alp. It's also very protective of its hat, mind you, because it grants him power, so it won't like it if you try to grab it. This hat is said to give the Alp the power of invisibility, which in the Witcher world is given to the Bruxa instead, of course. Interestingly, both these origin stories state that the Bruxa and Alp are impossible to kill. In the Witcher, of course, we hear from Regis that only another vampire can truly kill a vampire. But he doesn't specify whether this applies to higher vampires only, or literally any vampire. However, when we meet Detlaf for the first time, he tells us we've butchered a Bruxa who was dear to him. So, can we assume that anything but a true higher vampire is entirely killable? Well, we can't assume anything, of course, but it seems very likely. The final story, which I believe mostly influenced the Alp, is about the Irish Jark Du, literally Red Bloodsucker. The girl at the center of this story was a legendary beauty with blood-red lips and pale blonde hair. Very reminiscent, of course, of the Bruxa and Alps turning into beautiful women to lure their victims. Many tried to win her hand, for she was not only beautiful on the outside, but also within. However, instead of a nobleman, she fell in love with a broke peasant. He was kind and beautiful also, but her father cared only for money. So instead, her father gave her to an old, cruel man, who abused her day and night while the father gained more riches through this marriage. Her new husband delighted in drawing blood from his new wife, and in the end, she committed suicide by starving herself. 
Before she died, she renounced God and vowed a terrible vengeance. The village had known that her husband was a cruel man, but none had come to her rescue. And so she rose from the dead the night she was first buried, remembering the blood she lost by her husband's hands, and she became Jack Du. After killing both her father and her husband, now she would steal blood from innocence, singing a strange haunting song to lure them into the night where she would take their blood. So if I'm not wrong, we find most of the Bruxa and Alp characteristics in these three tales. Bruxae and Alps are truly very alike, and they seem to get along quite well, too, considering we sometimes see them work in groups in The Witcher 1. Much unlike the Katakan, which is a curious vampire indeed. Katakan are sometimes classified among the higher, more intelligent types of vampires, but sometimes they're classified as lesser ones. The main reason for this is their age. The older a Katakan gets, the more adept, powerful and intelligent they seem to become. The truly ancient ones are even capable of disguising themselves fully as functioning humans, much like the true higher vampires do. Case in point, Hubert Reich, the Katakan that attacks Priscilla. He hides among the people as a coroner. When in their vampire form, it's relatively easy to determine how old a Katakan truly is by looking at their claws. A Katakan's claws continue to grow throughout their entire life, and of course they don't generally cut them as they're used to murder with. They also have a slightly more dangerous cousin, the Nekurat, but we've never seen those in-game. We can assume they're simply far more violent Katakans, though, as they are both described as enormous bats. Katakans can also turn invisible, seems to be a vampire theme, and they are notably more powerful during the night, perhaps through the influence of the moon. Unlike most vampires, Katakans do seem to have differing personalities as well. They're not always simply driven by bloodlust. In the case of Hubert, he wished to purge the city of heathens. In the case of Gale, he wanted to drink drunk people's blood and collect shiny jewelry. Or in the case of the unnamed sleeping Katakan, he just wanted to bloody sleep. Katakans might have originated from the Crete Katakano. They are known to constantly grin, so from a distance one might suspect it's just a friendly stranger. However, when it gets closer, it spits tainted blood at their victims, burning and blinding them. They're also described as very fast and very strong, and it's quite arrogant by nature. Now, quite like the Katakan, is the Ekimara or Ekima. This vampire is a lesser type, though. Intelligence doesn't quite come into it, it only hunts. Like the Katakan, it looks suspiciously like an overgrown bat. But unlike the Katakan, it doesn't just drain the blood and perhaps takes a few bites. No, it tears its victims to pieces and then slurps the blood off the ground, because that's sufficient, clearly. Akimara have some of the obvious vampire traits, like exceptional speed, great regeneration and invisibility, but are mainly known for their exceptionally fast and powerful strikes that they land in quick succession, capable of destroying even the best Mahakama made armor into tiny shards. Ekimaras are likely based on the Edimu or Ekimu from the Sumerian religion, one of the oldest vampire myths. Described as ghostly creatures, a vampire that initially emerges as a soft blurry shape with no bones, just bags of blood with red glowing eyes, and instead of a nose, a sharp snout that he sucked blood with. If it survived for 40 days, it would develop bones and a body and become even more dangerous. This also seems to have influenced the Katakan lore, though, as they do become more powerful with age. They were sometimes also described as winged demons or evil wind gusts. Ekimus were violent and angry vampires that did not in fact disappear, but instead hide among the homeless in big cities, bringing disease and pain. Another trait that they seem to share with the Katakan. It seems Ekimaras don't quite like the northern climate, though, a trait they share with our next vampire, the Fledder, also a quite bat-like lesser vampire. They generally hunt around run-down city districts, cemeteries, or even in the wilderness if you're unlucky. Instead of approaching head-on, they instead ambush their victims by diving right on top of them and completely destroying their target. And because someone has to be, the Fledder is actually the weakest vampire you can find, but still very, very dangerous, of course. Even when their victim is already dead, they still continue flailing at the body, 
And while it can jump very high, it can't actually fly. It doesn't seem like the flutter has any particular inspiration other than the general vampire one. It's literally a giant, very aggressive bat. But we get a better hint from its cousin, the Garcane. They look immensely like a flutter, but they're incredibly disgusting, or I should say even more disgusting than a flutter. So disgusting, in fact, that the sight of one can paralyze a person. It literally uses its ugliness as a weapon, often mistaken for a gargoyle due to their constant lurking on rooftops. They also dive onto their victims like flutters do, but they don't mind chewing on already existing corpses either. Maybe that's why they're so disgusting. But if they do get their talons on a live victim, they delight in tearing it to shreds and rolling around in the leftovers. They also come in the Alpha variety, which is just a stronger and slightly more cunning Garcane. They often kill for pleasure too, not just to satisfy their hunger. In Australian folklore, the Garcane is a hairy man-sized bat creature with massive black wings and vicious canine teeth. It's not necessarily described as drinking blood, but as consuming flesh. It hunts by roosting in a tree and waiting for innocent passerbys to jump on top of and tear to shreds. However, it's often not even necessary to truly fight, because its immense stench renders most people unconscious. Pretty spot on as far as Witcher Garcanes go. There is one final vampire we need to talk about though. The proto -fletter. We meet this vampire in the cave of the Unseen Elder, and this place deserves a video entirely on its own. So that's just what we'll do. In the next episode, we'll dissect that particular cave as best we can. But until then, I hope you enjoyed this bit of story, and I'll see you next time. Va fail!